thanks. So let me just uh, start my timer. Okay. Thanks so much all for staying till the last talk of the day, except for the talk that you're all going to stay for anyway. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Moshe Vabayov, who's here, and uh, Ishai Mansour and Chai Moran. Um, so, um, one slide on single item pricing. Um, we have a very, very simple model in stark contrast to the previous uh, talk. We have a single seller, has a single item that she would like to sell, to sell and she uh, has no use for the item if it's unsold. And she would like to sell that to a single buyer who has a private value for the item. The value is the maximum price that the buyer is willing to pay for the item. And the buyer's value is drawn from some underlying distribution. And the seller wishes to price the item, so no fancy mechanisms, just post a take it or leave it price on the item. And of interest in the past few years, uh, as uh, Ellen uh, discussed in her talk, the seller does not know the underlying distribution from which the buyer's value comes from, uh, but is only given a number of samples drawn independently from this distribution, but would nonetheless try to somehow uh, post a price to maximize, to, to get good revenue guarantees and expectation over the underlying distribution. So uh, we're all here in the uh, EC or Econ CS community. And uh, sometimes, unfortunately, even though we're trying to build bridges between Econ and CS, when you get reviews over papers or whatnot, it kind of seems like this. Uh, because the, really, there's a lot of different taste between, uh, ma matter of taste between CS and Econ. CS likes worst case analysis. Econ likes Bayesian analysis. CS li uh, is perfectly content with constant factor approximations. Econ would usually like to have precise maximization or at the worst case up to epsilon approximation. And it's quite a big difference, but we're trying to, to build bridges here anyway between uh, these two things and these two approaches. And one of the major pro set of problems studied throughout the past few years and even before that in EC is that of, of uh, auctions and pricing and, and to take a very, very simple example, single item pricing. And one of the most fabulous bridges I think that was built uh, above this problem is the bridge of sample complexity, where the number of samples shows how much you're clo how close or far you are to CS or Econ in some sense. Zero samples is really a worst case kind of analysis. Only get, uh, one sample, also very close to worst case, only gives you a constant factor approximation. Infinitely many samples, very close intuitively to Bayesian analysis where you're completely, where you completely know the, the distribution and, and you can do up to epsilon stuff. And really there has been a lot of research on one hand on polynomially many samples, sorry for giving just the abbreviations, there was no point on the slide, no, no room on the slide, and it's only things that have to do with a single item. And uh, on the other hand, there's been uh, research about what can be done with one sample. And uh, quite surprisingly, um, there's been nothing in the middle. So this entire amazing bridge has been left uh, un unexplored for now. So this talk is going to be about uh, the next step in this bridge of two samples. <laughs> and we're going to ask uh, what seems like a very fundamental question. Are two samples really better than one sample? We're going to ask this question in a variety of ways. So um, to make things even more concrete and simple, we're going to focus on one pricing algorithm and arguably the most natural pricing algorithm called ERM or empirical revenue maximization, whereby the seller chooses to the price that maximizes revenue and expectation over the empirical distribution. So the seller looks at the uniform distribution over the samples so far, be it one sample, two sample, many samples, and just picks the price that would maximize the, the revenue if the, sell, the buyer really comes from this distribution. That's kind of the most intuitive thing to do. And just for example, if there's one sample, then it means something, uh, one sample V1, then it means that ERM will price at V1. If we have two samples, V1 greater or equal to V2, then if we price at V2, we sell, on, on assuming that the empirical distribution is the true distribution, we would sell with probability one, giving us empirical, expected empirical revenue, uh, sorry, probability one, giving us expected empirical uh, revenue V2. If we price at V2, we sell with probability half. 
uh, giving us expected empirical revenue V1 over 2. So if V1 is greater than two, uh, twice V2, so for example, if V1 is 5 and V2 is 2, we'll price at 5, giving us uh, expected empirical revenue of 2.5. If V1 is 5 and V2 is 3, we'll price at V2, giving us expected empirical revenue of 3, which is more than 2.5. So uh, let's recap what's known about a single sample. So ERM for a single sample is just pricing at the sample. So Dangwat and Tai, Raf Garden and Jan, 2015, they show that given one sample, this is, was very surprising for me to hear, ERM guarantees already at least half of the optimal revenue when the underlying distribution is regular, where regularity or myosin regularity is a tail condition without which basically we can't give any guarantee for general distributions. So this has become the standard thing that we assume. Um, Wang Mansour Roughgarden, a bit later than that, shows that this guarantee of one half a regular distribution actually is tight. It cannot be improved upon by any deterministic pricing algorithm. And then a very surprising result by uh, Fu, Imorlik, Halusier, and Strack, uh, a bit later than that, they managed to improve, slightly improve one half using a randomized pricing algorithm. And our main question is going to be, how does the worst case guarantee of two sample ERM compared to this one half worst case guarantee of one sample ERM? So um, let's talk about results and let's start uh, building our intuition from what happens when we go from one sample to, to two samples. So we'll have a series of questions here and each of them we're going to ask whether it's true for regular distributions. First question, you have distribution F. Is it true that ERM using two revenues, two, two samples is going to give you a, a higher expected revenue than ERM using one sample? G guesses? That's true. False? We show that. Next question, if we have two regular distributions F and G such that ERM using one sample gives you higher revenue from F uh, than from G, higher expected revenue, does this mean that using two samples, you'll have a higher revenue from F than from G? Guesses? Okay, you're more careful after the first question. False. Third question, F's first order stochastically dominates G. That means that for each price, there is higher revenue from F than from G, or if you wish, for each price, more, uh, there's higher probability of sale if the buyer comes from F than from G. Does this mean, it's well known that under this condition, if you have ERM using one sample, you're going to get higher expected revenue from F than from G. Is th does this still hold under two samples? No, we're going to see a proof soon. <laughs> Last question. Uh, that's the main question I was alluding to earlier. Um, you, you take the infimum over all regular distributions F. Uh, we know that for one sample, the uh, worst case, but what you can guarantee is one half of the optimal revenue. Uh, what you can get from uh, ERM using two samples, that's more than half, exactly half, less than half. Guesses, anyone? More than half, that's actually our main theorem, main result. There exists a, content, a constant strictly higher than one half, such that for every regular distribution F, ERM using two samples, um, from F gives uh, more than C of opt. So in particular, it implies uh, this result that the worst case guarantee uh, of ERM2 samples for regular distributions is C, which is greater than the worst case guarantee for one. And it's actually the first proof that some, any deterministic mechanism based on two samples can guarantee expected revenue more than half of opt. And even more than that, it's not clear to us which other candidate mechanisms exist for getting this guarantee. So um, a bit of, of analysis. Uh, we'll do the analysis in quantile space because that's where the, uh, it's easier to ha um, use the regularity condition. That's due to previous papers. So the quantile of a price P is simply the probability that a value drawn from the distribution is going to be at least P. That is a sale probability when you post the price P. So we can draw the revenue curve in quantile space. So basically, it's a, a function from quantiles between 0 and 1 to revenue. So here's the revenue of a quantile Q. And this is the revenue of the optimal uh, quantile that gives the highest uh, revenue. 
And regularity tells us that the revenue curve in quantile space is convex. That's why it's easy to, that's why it's convenient to look at these kinds of results in quantile space. And note that whatever f is, the quantile of a value sampled from f is distributed uniformly in 0, 1. That's, uh, that's just a, um, a, general, uh, a, a general property of quantiles. And observing that, uh, Dankwat Nutai et al. Uh, argued that the expected value from ERM1 sample is simply the area under the curve, because you uniformly draw a quantile and then get the revenue from that quantile, because the ERM using one sample is simply prices at the sample. And then they say, OK, since the curve is convex, uh, this area is at least half of opt, because this triangle has area half of opt. Um, so this is the, what happens with one sample. So what happens with two samples? So with two samples, I remind you that ERM doesn't compare quantiles. It doesn't even know the quantiles of the samples that it gets. It compares values. It wants to know whether the value, the highest value is more or less than twice the value of the lower, of the lower sample in order to know uh, which price to post. So we have here Q1. That's the lower quantile, meaning that it's the quantile of the higher sample. And this is the revenue from Q1. And I remind you that the revenue is the quantile, which is the sale probability, times the value. So the value is this slope, V1. And if you want to know uh, which quantiles will price at V1 and which uh, which, uh, for which V2 will price at V1 rather than V2, we'll take a look at this line with half the slope. And we'll get this threshold such that if, if Q2, the quantile of the lower value, is here, then ERM will price at V1, otherwise ERM will price at V2. So you see that it's kind of a weird mixture of quantiles and values. And indeed, for this reason, it can be shown that ERM using two samples, it's not only re not related to the area be uh, beneath the curve, it's not any kind of weighted area beneath the curve even. And I remind you that I told you that stochastic dominance, meaning that if we had uh, a revenue curve of f being above g at any point. That's what first order stochastic dominance means. It doesn't, means that, it doesn't mean that ERM from the higher revenue curve is going to give you a higher expected revenue when you have two samples. So let's actually look at, the, at an example that gives that. So we'll look at uh, g is going to be a very, very simple revenue curve. Values distributed uniformly on one, one plus epsilon for some very small epsilon. And we're going to take f, and before that, note that ERM always chooses the better sample, right? Between 1 and 1 plus epsilon, you're always going to choose the lower value because nothing there has a factor of 2 from nothing else. And the lower value is what you want in this case because you're going to get revenue roughly equal to, to, the, um, to uh, where this price lies between 1 and 1 plus epsilon. So in this case, you get uh, two samples. You're going to get the, uh, you're going to post the better quantile, and you're going to get the uh, revenue equal, more or less, to the quantile that you chose. So ERM using two samples is going to give you two thirds, which is the expected maximum of two uh, values sampled from uh, zero one uniformly. So let's take f to be to have a slight bump compared to g. So we added the slight bump at the zero point one of height 0.22, and you're probably asking at this point, I want to show you that the expected revenue from f using ERM2 samples is less than g. And first thing that comes to mind is that actually, by adding this bump, I've improved the revenue from posting any price that comes from a quantile between 0 and 0 0.1. But let's do this um, threshold thing again, and let's see, there is a, we have a slope here of 2.2. Uh, Let's take a look at half the slope and let's see where it leads us. And by the same calculation as before, we see that whenever the second quantile is here and the first quantile is here, we'll actually post at the first quantile, which is worse. So when the first quantile is less than 0 0.1, the second quantile is more than 0 0.571, in this example, we'll choose the worst sample. So we have kind of a trade-off between better revenue from uh, quantiles here from f compared to g, but choosing the worst sample versus the better sample 
in, in a large fraction of the, uh, of the revenues uh, of the quantile space and, and losing a lot of revenue due to that. And if you do the calculation, you'll see that the overall revenue impact is negative. So, so there's a really some subtle stuff going on here. And our main result, as I said, is that there exists a constant greater than two that ERM uh, using two samples guarantees from uh, any regular distribution. And since it's unknown to us what the worst case distributions look like, using a single sample, it's triangles using the same calculation that I showed you earlier, triangle revenue curves are their worst case uh, revenue curves. Here we have no idea what the worst case revenue curves are. So our analysis really has to lower bound the revenue from any regular distribution without restricting this space. And unfortunately, so for the last few minutes of this talk, I know that it's expected of me to tell you how beautiful our proof is. I'm actually gonna tell you how crummy our proof is and how much it needs improving. So sorry for that. So actually, we resort to case analysis and a quite detailed case analysis. We analyze the revenue conditioned on both samples being below the ideal price. So on the right-hand side of the peak and both samples on the uh, left-hand side of the peak uh, in quantile space and one sample on each side. And each of these three cases involves additional case analysis and to, to the point that it seems intractable to use our methods even for three samples. So the major thing, question that we leave here open is whether this kind of monotonicity, uh, worst case guaranteed fraction um, from n plus one being more than guaranteed from n really holds for every n. Does this monotonicity improve behind going from, beyond going from one to two? And this is gonna require some uh, more aesthetic analysis than, than the, the, the uh, brute force stuff that we do. So I'll just give you a, a, a taste of just how brute force and, and icky our analysis is. So as I told you, we analyze the revenue uh, condition upon each of these three scenarios, the guaranteed fraction of the revenue. So for the first case of both samples being below the ideal price to the right of the, of the um, peak in quantile space, we get this guarantee, which is, so, Think of this as greater than one half, we checked, but deteriorates as the optimal quantile Q star grows. You can see that some case analysis was put into this alone. For the second case, we get, okay, reasonable something above half, that's good. For the third case, think of this as less than one half, so we don't, can't even, for this specific case, match the guarantee of one half given one sample, and it deteriorates even more as Q star grows. So we have something that's greater than one half, something that's less than one half. You do, you, you um, mix these together with this, you get something reasonable, but it, both of these deteriorate as Q star grows to, to a point where it's a bit alarming of what we do with high Q stars. So the nice thing is that we um, weight all of these as we should according to the probability of each of these events happening. And it so happens then when, that when Q star is large, there's a very high probability that both samples are above the ideal price. As you can see, these are the weights. And fortunately, this event has higher probability as Q star grows, which uh, tightening everything enough, as you see in these uh, expressions, we manage to do the charging properly and get something that's always above one half, uh, regardless of, of Q star. But as I said, really what's needed here is a proof from uh, the book, if I may, something really a better proof for two that could be generalized beyond two so that th there's a vast, vast playground here of fixed number of samples uh, higher than two that just waiting to be looked at and to complete this bridge between the, the CS and uh, econ approaches. And uh, I really hope that some of you will, uh, will want to take a look at this research direction. So thank you very much. Uh, ja Jamie was, okay. I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, good question, I don't know, I would, Imagine that they would be because that's usually the case, but we I tell you the truth, we haven't looked at that. But that's a perfectly good question. Even like looking at MHR and being able to generalize to uh, uh, any fixed number of samples would be very interesting. Your first example was MHR, which was your 
with a weird bump. Okay, so monotonicity, that specific monotonicity of first order stochastic dominance doesn't solve, but uh, maybe, maybe the general monotonicity could be proven there more easily. Thanks. No. <laughs> no, so ERM, sorry? So for two samples, I don't have any other candidate. That's what I said. If you have another candidate for two samples, I'd be thrilled to hear. When the number of samples grows very large, it's known that some kind of guarding helps from... And there are things that help when, when the number of samples grows very large. We looked at ERM because basically it was very arduous as it is. So you start from the simplest, you start to understand what's going on there and you go on from there. But indeed looking at, as I said, we don't have any other candidate for something that beats one half given two samples other than ERM. That's also very interesting. No one wants to ask how I did all the animations in LaTeX? <laughs> I'm kidding.